Welcome, everyone, to another podcast of the Center for Asian American Christianity at Princeton Theological Seminary. My name is David Chow. I direct the center, and I'm really happy to introduce a new podcast guest to our audience. Um, her name is Sangeetha Thomas. Sangeetha is a psychotherapist and owner of the Nepsis Counseling um, office in Dallas, Texas. Sangeetha, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, Sangeetha, you've been a lifelong member of the Indian Orthodox Church. How did you get interested in becoming a psychotherapist? It's a great question. Uh, it is not a common profession in my community as an, uh, as an Indian woman, but um, I would say my greatest turning point would be two things. One of them was I, I used to teach Sunday school at my church. Um, and in teaching teenagers, I noticed that they needed a lot of interpersonal connection. They wanted to relate. They wanted to not just sit there and passively learn, but they wanted somebody to help guide them through life. And I realized that there was such a need in my community for that type of relational healing, which is essentially what happens through therapy. Past that, I started an internship in my undergraduate studies where I worked as a crisis line um, specialist. So I was answering the suicide hotline calls and things like that. So that was my first like, you know, jumping into the deep end of the pool experience where I actually got to go through a, an intensive training and talk to people who were either contemplating suicide or were in the middle of other types of mental health crises. So that was my aha moment. And I just fell in love with it and decided, okay, I'm going to get a job out of college. I'm going to save up. I'm going to go to grad school and I'm going to fight that fight with my parents to go through a career that is not what they envisioned for me, but I have not regretted it ever since. And uh, it's been that's, great. That's so interesting. I, um, part of my own uh, vocational discernment process was I was supposed to go to medical school because my college undergrad was in molecular biochemistry and biophysics. I ended up in theology world. So there's there's a story there. I'm curious, how did how did your parents initially respond when you when they when you said to them you wanted to become a therapist? Uh it was I don't think they were too surprised because I had already at that point had changed my major from uh neuroscience to psychology and they were like, "What? No more science?" and I was, and so it was a whole conversation there. Um but yeah, initially it was just, I noticed a lot of unfamiliarity on their part. They just, they didn't have an understanding of what a therapist or a psychotherapist is. Um, and I think that's true for most immigrant to Asian communities that like, they that's not common. Um, and the most exposure that a lot of folks have, even if they are born and raised in the States, is counselor means school counselor, which is very different from a mental health psychotherapist specializing in trauma. Um, and so that was an initial sense of like, are you going to make enough money? Are you going to be successful? Is this a stable job? And and I think that was their way of saying, we love you and we don't want you to fail <laughs> in, in a matter of speaking. But um, yeah, it's it's been good since then. And every now and then I'll hear little pockets of my parents talking to other people saying like, oh, mental health is important. And I'm like, what was that? What was that? What did you say? And I like to rub it in there. You've broken through? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's been good. That's, um, you, you're basically giving a plug for why the Center for Asian American Christianity is now running a regular, an annual mental health conference to raise awareness about mental health within the Asian American community. Love so thank you for that, uh, that, Indirect plug, Sangeetha. I, <laughs> I love appreciate that. You're that. Doing that. You you mentioned now an intern experience with the trauma hotline, and um or or kind of crisis hotline, and you focus on trauma in in your psychotherapy. So, say a little bit more about how you developed this uh, interest or specialization uh, with trauma. Yeah. Um, so I would say trauma is something that once you start to see it, you can't not see it wherever you go, um, or at least that's how I experienced it. And and that's what really pulled me in. It was like this common thread that um, uh, it just everywhere I looked, it just seemed to be popping its head up. And I was like, what is this thing? And um, so it didn't matter if I was 
you know, if I, when I was working on the hotline, the crisis hotline, it came up a number of times. I remember one of the calls that I remember vividly that was really impactful on me was a, um, a veteran who was calling having a PTSD flashback on the phone with me. And uh, that was my first time ever having, like I had heard vaguely of the term PTSD as most of us do as this vague acronym, but that was my first time experiencing it or co-experiencing it with another person. Um, so that happened. And beyond that, I worked at a, a domestic violence agency. I, I had through that position had worked in a rehab facility with teenagers who had, you know, survived prostitution and all kinds of drug addictions and were in rehabilitation. There was all kinds of patterns of trauma everywhere that I went, every job that I took that was in the field or related to the field. There was, everybody had some kind of family history or personal history with trauma. And from there is where I really started, you know, when you go to grad school for being a therapist, you apply first to yourself and then you learn how to apply the theories to other people. And so when we learned family theories and we learned about generational trends, I had a big project where I had to go back three generations in my family and try to identify patterns and apply the family theories uh, of psychotherapy to my own family and realized, oh, wait, I've got trauma too. And, uh, and I think it just opened my eyes to realizing this is everywhere. It is huge. It is prevalent, not only in my life, but in my entire community and nobody's talking about it. And so I decided I'm going to be that person and be part of that change. And I'm not the only one. I, obviously, you've had people in your last conference who were amazingly uh, gifted in, in speaking in this area, researching this area. And it's going to take more of us addressing it to, to fully tackle the issue and break all of those cycles of generational trauma. But I think we're, we're closer now than we've ever been. And I'm, I'm excited to be a part of that. You brought up the January 2024 Mental Health Conference, and one of the phrases from Jessica Chen Feng, one of our plenary speakers, and I think one of her, her graduate students is working in this area, is just called migrational trauma mm -hmm. or trauma related to the migration experience where we become dislocated from our homelands, our cultures, our languages, our kinship networks that were so familiar and important to us mm -hmm. through the process of migration and get plopped into a, a country with different norms, languages, uh, different um, relational networks that we have to navigate, sometimes without a job, sometimes without social support. So this, your background in trauma, I, I find to be very helpful as a way to frame the mental health conversation. Mm -hmm. In one of our recent conversations, Sangeetha, you had mentioned traveling and speaking to an Orthodox community that had been struggling with death in their community. Um, you, you don't have to speak directly about this experience, but I want to just talk about death um, because our last conversation, we spoke extensively about death. And part of the reason I want to talk about death is because... Um, I don't think U.S. culture knows how to talk about death. Mm -hmm. I, I think the Christian faith and our, the, the shared scriptural stories that we have centering in Christ and Christ's death and resurrection give us hope beyond the grave. So there are important biblical and theological resources to ground our conversations about death. But then to integrate the two we may not know how to do, even for pastors. Yeah. Um, and so I'm thinking about faith leaders out there who are caring for an older community, or perhaps there are young people who have sadly taken their lives. And this creates a, a crisis and even trauma within families and communities. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of set up um, some of our recent conversation that, that I'd like to plug into this you know, your expertise in clinical experience, uh, being a psychotherapist who specializes in trauma therapy, and then the specific topic of death. So I'd, I'd love to just hear some opening comments from you, uh, especially 
as as that trip to the community is relatively recent, what did that provoke in in your own kind of reflections as well as your clinical practice as it pertains to death? Right. Yeah. And I, I love the conversations we've been having lately. And I think it's it's such a huge topic that we can just like try to broach it, but it's like this iceberg. There's so much more once you get into it. And um, so, yeah, I would say, you know, tra- death is not necessarily always traumatic, but there is definitely a link there. And I would say like the simplest, you know, uh, boiled down version of defining a trauma is something that changes how you view yourself and how you view the world. Um, it is this rupturing uh, that happens internally, right? It's not, the trauma is not necessarily what happens to you. It's the meaning that you make of it um, within. And so when we take that broad definition of trauma, that it is meaning and it changes how you view yourself, it changes how you view the world, it says a lot about how we relate to death, how we interpret death, how we find meaning in death can can result in similar traumatic patterns or similar patterns as to what I see in trauma. So uh, in this con- this uh, conference that I spoke at with the Indian Orthodox community, that was a huge part of what I, what I kept talking to them about was this is understanding death is fundamental to our spiritual formation and our own mental well-being. Like if we can't reconcile the idea of death with life, then we might because our brains are meaning-making machines, we might land on the wrong foot. We might land on this meaning or this interpretation of what death is, why death exists, that is actually rupturing our relationship with God, rupturing our relationship with ourselves or, or with our family or, or whatnot. I mean, I think to put that into a less clinical terms and more colloquial terms, I would say most of us probably know somebody who has gone through a traumatic experience with death, like for example, uh, a beloved, very, very close person to them dies and you just are angry with God as a result. How could God let that happen? That is potentially a rupturing of your relationship with God, potentially a rupturing of your relationship with your own spiritual identity. That internal process of rupturing can be traumatic in terms of spiritual formation and uh, mental well-being because if I've believed one thing about myself, who God is, God is good, God is loving, God will save, and my faith is going to keep me strong no matter what, and all of a sudden this death happens and it shakes you to your core. Now I'm not that anymore. I can't believe that anymore because this is not good anymore. Um, I'm not saying that everybody will land there, but some people can. Um, And so that would be, if I had to kind of piecemeal a connection between trauma and death and the internal experience, that's what I see. Um, And I also see a lot of folks in my office who have gotten their, their faith shaken and turn out well, they grow in resilience, they grow in deepening their faith and in expanding that definition of death within faith. Um, And that's a beautiful, beautiful process to see. And that's what gets me really excited about this topic of death and grief is They're not inherently traumatic topics. They're not inherently even mental health topics, Um, but they are so a part of the human experience that I just get excited to talk about it at all. So I love this. Your excitement is palpable. (laughs) And already you've made several distinctions that are so helpful. The distinction that um, death itself is not necessarily traumatic. Um, And the process you laid out with the human brain as a meaning-making entity and how things become traumatic related to death, specifically when there's a rupture in our understanding of God, especially as it is tied to our understanding of ourselves and whether we can retain those understandings pre the death experience within our orbit and after, right? So there, you're saying this death thing that occurs, whether it's, uh, you know, in the community, in our family, with a loved one, it introduces something that we have to adapt to and to make meaning out of. Absolutely. And I think the inference is if we don't make meaning out of that rupturing event, 
then there could be further loss. Mm-hmm. Is, is, is that part of what you're in, what we can infer? Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say I would bring it down um, to the idea of core beliefs. And um, so in trauma work, a lot of times we have to boil it down to what is the belief? What's the meaning that you made of this moment? Um, and so if you generally believe that God is good, God is a protector, God, it, you have safety in God, in God the Father, um, when that safety is threatened through death or the idea of or that core belief, I am safe, is now challenged by the fact that oh, my life is not in my own hands. And it can be snatched away in a moment's notice. All of a sudden, I'm not safe anymore is the is the now belief that is challenging that core belief. Um, and so I would, you know, I would sum it down to that if we had to is like, what's your core belief about who God is? And is God still safe? Is God still a protector despite the death? And if the answer to that is yes, then great. Now you have this pathway for your faith to deepen. But for some folks, it becomes a turning, like a fork in the road where, okay, I thought God was safe. I thought I was safe and secure in him. I thought he was good all the time and he didn't allow bad things to happen, you know, and that that turns into a, well, I tried to live, they tried to live a great life and they still died when they were 20. And so what's the point? Um, And it becomes a lot more cynical. I want to follow up and, and talk a little bit about spiritual formation, but I also want to let our audience know. I don't think that's your dog that's barking. It's your neighbor's dog. <laughs> no, is, that, is that what it definitely is? Definitely my dog. He barks in his sleep and he is just <laughs> doing his thing. I was really worried that would pick up on the microphone, but... No worries. Yeah. No worries. No, that's that's fine. As, as long as you're not needed immediately. <laughs> no, no, he is knocked out, curled up in a ball, barking in his sleep. <laughs> He must be chasing the mailman or something in his sleep. Um, so you've you've brought up our relationship with God, and I want to dig a little deeper into this topic of um, our relationship with God and spiritual formation, and why death and the grieving process impacts our spiritual formation. Could you kind of just begin to open up that conversation? Sure. Um, so with grief, the the way I see it is that. Um, you know, we used to follow back in the early days of grief development and research, this five stages of grief, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, that that was, that's something a lot of folks are familiar with. The main criticism of that model is that it, it implies a linear. Oh, and Sangeeta, can you, can you just reiterate, if you can, the five stages for those who may not be aware what they oh, are? Oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, I don't have all of them memorized, but I don't have all of them memorized, but a lot of, I think it starts with anger and then it ends with resolving. Um, basically, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross researched folks who were um, in their final stages with terminal illness and found a commonality of five stages of emotions that they tend to go through until they reach a state of resolution or peace in approaching death. And so- I think denial was one of them, right? So I think denial, anger, and then there's a couple in the middle. And honestly, I I don't adhere to it. And most folks don't anymore, which is why I don't have them memorized because death is not linear. And so Kubler-Ross actually, in hindsight, went back and said, okay, yeah, they're not supposed to be stages. These are just some things that come up in the grief process. And so she actually even qualified her own work after the fact. So, um, which is common, right? In, In any type of research field, like we have this pioneering model, and then later we're like, okay, hold on. Freud was not 100% how we view the human person or, or uh, you know, five stages is not how we view grief. So now we actually see it as a recursive process. And so that's part of why when you ask me, what is it that makes grief so difficult is that, you know, death is not something we can go and experience and then come back. You know, if I want to experience Italy, I can go to Italy if I can afford it, go there, experience it and come back and tell people about it. I can put it on my Instagram. I can post about it. I can share things, you know, whatever. And if I want to experience um, a new place or a new thing or a new food, I can go and experience it and then come back with my experience. But death is not like that. You can't experience it. And so we're all approaching like this train. We're approaching this destination that we've all, none of us have ever been to and been back except for Christ. 
and and how are we supposed to understand what it is what it feels like and sending our loved ones there and not getting them back you know and experiencing it just as this intense separation um that's hard for the for the mind for the brain to wrap its wrap itself around like abstract is really really difficult even in maturity for children of course absolutely they don't even have abstract thinking until age four but like adults even have a difficult time with that abstraction um even, I mean, you see it even in our language, like we talk about the sun rising and setting when re- nobody says, oh, the earth is on its rotation, on its axis and turning around the sun, right? Like that's literally what's happening. But we we view things in this egocentric, difficultly, you know, uh, it, difficult to abstract and difficult to to try to talk about things literally as they are. And, and we just kind of experience them in our own egocentric way. And then we try to communicate them and we try to wrap our heads around them and we try to understand it. And it's just, it never really quite captures this thing that we've never gone and experienced ourselves. Um, so in an abstract context, it, as an abstract concept, it is really, really difficult for us to wrap our heads around just, just because it's not something we can go and experience and come back from. Um, the second thing is, is that death is Uh, grief is a recursive emotional process. And so we don't just go through this linear, you know, five steps, and then you're done processing it, it comes up over and over and over for the rest of your life. Who, you know, if you lost a parent, if you lost a child, if you lost whoever in your life, you think about them over and over and over. And it's not like this unhealthy rumination, hopefully not, but it can go that way. Um, For most folks, it's more like, you know, I have a friend who every time her birthday comes around, she thinks about when it, how is, it's not fair for me to have another year, another birthday, another year of life when my when my dad was robbed of that, when my dad passed away, you know. And so now birthdays feel different because of the grief that is now in that, you know. And, and I think a lot of folks listening will probably resonate with that every time you have a birthday or a life experience that you wish you could have shared with somebody who's no longer here on Earth. Um, you re-experience your grief in a different way on your wedding day when somebody is not there or when a child is born and somebody who, who's not there, who you wanted to be there, you know? And um, so that recursive nature of something abstract that we can never quite capture comes up over and over and over and over. And so it constantly challenges your idea of that core belief. Am I safe? Am I secure in God? Who is God if he allows this thing to happen and allows me to re-experience this for the rest of my life. It is very helpful to hear about this recursive process of grieving over death rather than simply a linear one and done. I think part of what makes modern life modern is we like three steps, one and done, move on to the next thing, right? And what I'm hearing from you is, no, death and grieving doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. The human emotions that are processing this are complex. So let's, let's talk about processing. Um, How do we process death and grieving and maybe identifying some healthy or unhealthy ways to process death and grieving? Sure. Yeah. And I think uh, it's funny because processing as a therapeutic term is such a common baseline vocabulary word, right? Like emotional processing, let's process that. Let's talk about that. And as in a center for Asian American Christianity, it makes me, I couldn't help but think after our last conversation, like how many Asian people talk about processing or have experienced processing with their immigrant parents? And honestly, like, I don't even know my family, <laughs> you're shaking your head vigorously. Um, so I'm, my family is from South India in a state called Kerala that speaks Malayalam. I don't speak Malayalam well, but I don't even know the Malayalam word for emotion. Like feelings, I there is no, I don't know the word for that. And so, and I'm not fluent, so maybe that's that's my thing. But like talking about what do we lose in immigration? Your first generation kid is not fluent in your mother tongue, but um, I don't know the word for emotion. Or feeling, and I wonder how many people born and raised here know the the their parents' language word for emotions, for feeling, for trauma, for 
I'm having a hard time or I'm feeling really depressed or down or this is really weighing on me. We can say that in English and I know exactly what you're talking about. But like, I have no idea how my parents would even communicate that. And quite honestly, it's because they never did. Growing up, I never really experienced my parents expressing and processing emotion. They talked about death. More specifically, they talked about who died. And it was like news information, right? Like this person who you remember from this place and we were so close, they died in this way. And it's it's almost this autobiographical uh, or biographical recounting of who a person was in their life and how they died. And that was basically how my parents processed grief. And and so um, we even make fun of my, my, me and my siblings make fun of my mom now who like all, randomly will bring up who died. And it's like just how she, pro- I think that's how she processes is that she brings up who died and she'll tell us the whole story of who was this person and remember them and they used to carry you around and get you all excited. And then she says, they died last week and we just plummet in emotion. Um, And that's her way of remembering. That's her way of processing is to talk about it, but with very little emotional connection and more of biographical and historical connection. So um, processing is really, you and I spoke about it last week briefly, is we have one area of our brain that is very much more abstract, relational, experiential. And another area of our brain that is very logical and concrete and does the verbal processing. And so when we as therapists talk about processing your emotions, it's about take it's about basically making this neural pathway between what you're feeling intuitively as a gut reaction to what is going on, your internal world, experiencing it enough to understand it for yourself and then to bring it to this other side of your brain that is able to put words to that. And then by sharing it with another person, you have all of this consciousness and awareness. So it's this whole neural circuit, this pathway that is happening just in your brain from feeling to thinking about how you're feeling, to putting it into words, and then building your awareness around it. That's processing. And uh, that's what happens in therapy. That's what happens when we talk. That's what happens when you and I are sipping on coffee and having a whole conversation. We are doing that with our emotions, with the topic. Um, So talking about it, to, to boil it all down, talking about it is how we process grief. We have to take that intuitive, intense, abstract emotion and put words to it and share it with another person. Oh, wow. All right. I am I am learning so much. The neural pathway that you outlined, I, I'm going to bookmark it. I think we might have to pursue that as a podcast in and of itself. Um, so let me let. But before that, you were talking about the cultural coding of processing, especially on the linguistic side. I think that's super helpful. Mm-hmm to identify intergenerational differences within Asian immigrant immigrant family households with first gen parents who may not be English speakers or have great facility with the English language to their second generation US born um, children who only speak English or don't speak the, the mother tongue and how therefore the processing process will be different based on the linguistic differences. So that's kind of how I'm unpacking. Yeah, and I see you nodding. So, and and we can pick that up or not. On the neural, neural pathway, so there's like three stages generally. I just wanna unpack the junctures, the two junctures. So let, I'm gonna ask two related questions. So this is kind of the nerd side of me asking these questions. I'm very curious. Um, what happens if we don't linguistify the amorphous or like the the kind of raw emotional experience. So that first one is about connecting the brain. Okay. So to the language side of things, what happens if we don't, that's the first question. Second question is expressing the linguistic stuff. So it comes out of the brain brain side into the social space. So that's a therapeutic or a good, a good friend, Mm -hmm. right? So what happens if we don't process it socially, like, and it just remains stuck in our brain. Right. Um, 
Great question. Um, so I would say with the first one, when it's just this intense internal emotional experience and you don't bring it into your language center, it's it kind of leaves uh, the emotion just charged. And, and I will say, I would do want to quantify this as like a, it's not a make or break type of thing where like, I don't want anyone to think they have to be a certain way. Um, some folks are more internal processors and some folks tend to be more external processors. You're never really fully either or all of us are both, but it's, you know, some people have a, a default mode that they tend to be more internal processors. Um, and so they, these are your people who are uh, more contemplative, um, more more quiet. Um, and then there's other folks who want to talk and talk and talk and talk and talk it out, you know. And so they, everybody has their, per, your personality comes in to play a, a part in this. Um, however, I will say that emotions are like energy and they do have to move somewhere. And so with trauma work, going back to my specialty area, a lot of times people will use the term, well, your body keeps the score. And that comes from Bessel van der Kork's Ovid Hook's work, um, where like the energy of an intense emotional experience can get trapped in the body and people can develop autoimmune disorders or muscle, you know, spasms or stiffnesses or whatever, based on emotions that they're holding for generation or for years or decades or generations. So um, that same thing can happen when you're going through an, an intensely emotional experience and you don't bring it into words, it can leave this abstract thing as like this giant bundle of mess versus when you can put it into words, it's almost like you, you kind of uncoil that mess and you sort it out. You know, it's like if you have a tent, you, we all have that box of electronic cords where you don't know what, what plugs into what and everything's kind of jumbled around. Putting it into words is like taking each individual one or Christmas lights, whatever it is, you know, you take each individual one, you wrap them up and you tie it with a little cable tie. So it's sorted. Um, it doesn't really get rid of the thing. It just sorts it. So it seems more manageable. It makes it less overwhelming. And so when you don't process in that way, it leaves it kind of in an overwhelming state where you just experience it and you experience it and you experience it. And then your only option is to either get fully overwhelmed by it or to chuck it in the trash or close the lid and forget that it exists. And you, you do this emotional avoidance and you go through these, um, you can oscillate between the two extremes of either I get overwhelmed by my emotions or I completely shut them down and I avoid them. And the middle ground is put words to it, help sort it out, sort out those cables, clean it up, manage it. And you can do that with God in dialogue through prayer you can do that with a friend or a therapist in, 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 you can do that with a journal, just putting words to the feelings, right? Like, what is this feeling? Where is this coming from? Why am I remembering this one memory that I had with this one person? What was important about that memory? And it's really those probing questions that help us to make sense of and reconcile this intense emotion with how we experience ourselves and God and the world. So the, social and externalizing expression part mm -hmm. seems to enable the linguistic part. In other words, it, what the key point is for the individual to linguistify the emotion, whether it's in a journaling process, maybe a prayer walk, they're talking to God or a therapeutic session mm -hmm. with the therapist. Okay. I, I see you nodding. So that, that kind of really helps um, yeah. to understand this neural pathway. Well, and I would add even, you know, we have a social neural pattern too. So it, it's harder over video, right? You and I over video, uh, we, we don't connect, our brains don't connect in the same way. However, we do have neurons that are specialized for connection. And so if we are re sitting in front of each other in the same room as therapist or a pastor or a priest or a friend, you are your body is attuning to the other person's body. And so there is healing that takes place just in the other person being present, being a caring, listening, open person, a compassionate person. You experience the compassion of Christ through other people. Um, and, and so there is a healing process, not just in putting words to it, but just crying next to another person with another person. 
and having that moment. Um, I remember when my grandmother passed away, my mom, speaking of the generational differences, my mom, eh, who I was just making fun of for bringing up who died next, eh, she is the oldest of her siblings. And I remember we all kind of gathered at one of the siblings' houses after my grandmother passed away. And my mom and her youngest brother just had this moment where they didn't say anything and they just hugged really tightly and two arms all the way across, hugged really, really tightly and just held it for a minute. And I remember like the house was pretty quiet. A lot of people weren't really talking, maybe a little bit of chatter here and there with people who had gathered in the home because my grandmother had passed away in India. And so that's all we could do is gather in the home that we had here. Um, they didn't say anything. They didn't, you know, linguistify. They didn't bring it into verbal uh, processing. But in that moment of just locking eyes and wrapping their arms around each other, they were present with one another. And so there was this moment of, for me, first of all, like, oh, I think that's the first time I've seen my mom and her siblings hug. Um, but then the, on the other hand, there was this intense moment of like, oh, there's the pain. There's the sadness. There's the grief. And it was never spoken in words. It was just felt it, because it was shared. Um, and, and so there is a lot to be said about relational healing, verbalized or non-verbalized, but um, combination of the two. I'm really struck by this notion that physical proximity, a sustained bear hug or group hug without words can, can um, mediate the presence of Christ in that this presence, physical presence is healing. Um, my, my last kind of bucket here for us to, to go into relates to um, how the Orthodox Church approaches death and your thoughts on how this could support Asian American Christians more broadly in our own formation and processing of grief. So you had mentioned how um, burial, the burial rites are a kind of sacrament mm -hmm. and that there's deep theological significance. I was wondering if you could unpack some of that for us. Sure. Yeah. So um, in the Orthodox Church, there is a liturgy for funeral services. And um, so it's a pretty extensive service. There's four parts to it. A lot of times people split it into more than one day because they don't, it's too long to do all in one day. Um, but I would say, I mentioned to you last time in our phone call too, that our basic framework for approaching how we understand death is that death is a tragedy, death is victory, and death is hope. And it's it's the three of those things that we find in Christ, that, that death was never intended in God's creative works. In creating Adam and Eve, death was not part of the picture. It came up about through sin. Um, so there is tragedy there. And then there is victory in Christ, overcoming death. Um, and then there is hope in, in the resurrection, in the second coming. And that those three themes are present in our funeral liturgy. Um, our focus in that liturgy is to, is to bring the focus back to God, who is God. And which is why at the beginning of our talk today, I was emphasizing that, you know, the trauma can occur where a person's view of God, their understanding of who God is fundamentally changes. And what I love about the funeral service in the Orthodox Church is that we focus on who God is. God is our creator. And why, by bringing up creation, we bring up that, that death was never part of the picture, that this death is not necessarily from God, but he has transformed it through Christ. And so we, we remind as a community, all of us remember what death is by remembering that it's a tragedy, by remembering that Christ is victorious, that God is a living God, um, and that that there is hope in the resurrection and that we are laying our our loved one, whether it's our parishioner or our family member, we are laying our loved one um, to eternal rest to in the hope of the resurrection. And, and to do this funeral service in the hope of the resurrection is, is a common phrase that's used throughout that whole, that whole service is remembering that our God is a living God and, and we are doing this sacrament in hope. Um, and that is something that I think, you know, if you're not Orthodox, 
it's okay. But I think you can take that, that, those three themes of tragedy, victory, and hope to help understand what death is, how do we hold death and weave it into the context of who God is and who Christ is in all of our lives and how tragedy can be transformed into hope is honestly what I love doing about uh, doing with treating trauma. How can I transform? How can I help this person, this client that is in front of me, transform this tragic experience, the traumatic experience into something that is resilient and hopeful and full of life. And that's possible through, through God to, you know, and I'm not saying that it was for good, but good can come of it. And um, I always think of and use the verse of um, Joseph in Genesis uh, when he when his brothers approach him after he's become Pharaoh. And I always use that that very, very last verse where where he finally reveals his identity to his brothers and they realize, oh, this is the Pharaoh. This is the Joseph that we sold off to slavery. Um, The sentence that he says to his brothers is you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And that is such a powerful thing to remember that like, yes, death is a product of sin and it is a tragedy and God can transform even that, that difficult thing that we can't even wrap our brains around. We can't even fully talk about. We can't even fully put words to and it's recursive and we struggle with it for the rest of our lives. That thing has been transformed by God too. That's really reassuring that I don't have to solve it. I just have to keep experiencing it and re-experiencing it with him in the context of my faith. And that's the whole point. That's what we do with grief. We just continue to experience it, experience it and we continue to reconcile it with our understanding of who God is. Um, so I think there's a lot to be unwrapped in that. But I do want to acknowledge, similarly to what you talked about in this January's conference uh, that I had a chance to listen to, was that our parents may not ever get to the point where they say all of that to us. And so it's up to us to, to start to break the generational pattern of not talking about it, the generational pattern of not acknowledging how death can impact you emotionally and impact you spiritually. But we can start to do that. We can start through conversations like this to say, how is that challenging your faith right now? How has that changed how you view God? You know, and we can have that dialogue. That's a a really profound and powerful message. I especially appreciate the the Old Testament scripture that you cited. Um, That's a... I think that's this is a, a good place to conclude our our podcast conversation. A little comment from me as I was listening to this kind of theological framing to give meaning to death. Because we began our podcast conversation by talking about human beings as meaning making creatures and how death disrupts that meaning making process. And then we've concluded by saying that scripture in its framing of creation to new creation culminating in the death and resurrection of Christ gives us a lens to make meaning out of death. And you cited the, the tragedy, the victory, and the hope associated with Christ. So that's, that's a really powerful theological message. It, it tells me that Christian theology and biblical theology are really important for pastoral ministry, for counseling, (laughs) because it helps religious people frame something productively. Mm -hmm. Um, So thank you, Sangeetha, for this this incredible podcast conversation. I really learned so much from you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for opening the door to this conversation, because I don't know how many folks out there are talking about their struggle with grief and understanding death. So uh, thanks for the good work that you're doing. And for our listeners out there, um, Sangeetha will be one of our several plenary speakers in the January 2025 Mental Health Conference. So we're going to continue this conversation come January and possibly with other podcasts. So stay tuned. Thank you all.